Industry Education Coordinator working with Regina District Industry Education Council and Sunwest School Division. Uh, today it's my pleasure to introduce Chelsea Billet, who is a multi-grade teacher currently teaching at Dinsmore Composite School. Dinsmore Composite School is a K-12 school located in West Central Saskatchewan. Chelsea will tell us about her career as a teacher and what it is like to teach in a small rural school. Just a reminder before we begin, the session is being recorded and will appear on the RDIEC YouTube channel for you or others to view in the future. We'd also like to request that any students who watch this session go to our website at www.rdiec.ca and complete the student survey that can be found near the top of the web page. Completion of the survey gets your name in a monthly draw for a $50 gift card. Again, the website is www.rdiec.ca. Once again, thank you for doing this, Chelsea, and welcome. I'll turn that over to you now. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for the introduction, Kevin. Um, so hi there, my name is Chelsea Billet. Um, I teach at Dinsmore, Dinsmore Composite School. And this is my first year at the school. Um, I've been in Sun West though, this is year 10. So just, sorry, I just wanna make sure I'm going in the right order here. So uh, my job description, um, we are at, uh, a K, so it's a K to 12 school here at Dinsmore. Uh, there's multi-grades um, and um, I have a variety of teaching subjects that I have. Um, so previously I spent the last nine years at Rosetown High School, which was great. Um, I'm teaching much the same that I was in Rosetown, but because of the smaller class sizes, the smaller numbers, I kind of had to broaden my horizon with what I'm teaching. So I've got a couple new curriculums that I'm teaching this year, um, but I'm gonna talk about how I'm easing into that. So um, I've kind of broken this into semester. So semester one, I've got us, uh, and then the, I've got split classes here. So ELA 9, 10 is a split class. I'm teaching two curriculums at once during that period. ELA 20, Psych 30, uh, Phys Ed 9 and 10, and Phys Ed 20 and 30. And then semester two, ELA 9 and 10 will continue on. The grade 10 changes from a, a, an A10 to a B10 course. I've got Health 9. Foods 30, which is new. I've got a lot of prep to do in the next month <laughs> in preparation for that. Phys Ed 9, 10, Phys Ed 20, 30 again. Um, things that I have, roles that I have assumed uh, during this time, I'm still, my principal calls it in the storming phase. I think what she means by that is when you, when you have new staff, they're trying to figure out where they fit, what their role is, what they are responsible for, what qualities they bring to the table, et cetera. So, so far, um, I have been in charge of the Remembrance Day service. Um, our grade 11 class was in charge of it this year. And that's something that I think I will continue to pursue as a humanities teacher here at DCS. I coached volleyball, I'll be coaching, I'll probably be doing some badminton for sure, some track and field here in the spring. Um, and I'm also on an 80% contract this year. So that's that's something new for me. I, uh, when accepting this job or applying for this job, um, there were courses like the history nine and 10 course, which is taught at once I was really apprehensive about. And so had an opportunity to do a job share with the gal who has been here for years, who taught both of those classes. And so that's who I'm job sharing with. She's here a little more than 20% because she's teaching some other classes other than just history and social, but it's been really cool. So every second afternoon, um, today being one of those afternoons, actually I don't teach, but I sit in class with the gal that I'm job sharing with and take notes and I'm basically a student during that time. So I'll talk a little bit about um, molding and, and shaping as much as you can your career to kind of fit what works for you. And obviously there are some limitations, but it's, it's worked out really well for me this year. Um, some days I certainly feel better suited for the job than others. I'm glad I'm doing this career spotlight after Christmas because I feel, I feel rested. I had a little bit of time to reflect and, and prepare over the Christmas break and that downtime too is, is just so important. So, so <clears throat> um, some traits, things that I, thought of that that make good teachers in my opinion um for me I think, well you need to enjoy kids I I'm not well suited for younger kids even though I have children of my own I I don't think I'd enjoy teaching them but I do like the older kids I'm teaching nine to twelve right now I think you need to be a people person you need to work well 
with others. You're going to be working with people who have um, a lot of different qualities um, that will amaze you. Um, I've worked with some really, and I'm still working with some really brilliant people and you're just constantly learning. You need to be a lifelong learning. You need to be adaptable. Look at life uh, during this pandemic as it, as it continues to soar here in numbers in Saskatchewan, you need to be adaptable, um, you need to be empathetic. Our kids are going through a lot. There's been um, a lot of additional stress put on our, our kids. I know I'm gonna talk about later on, we've, we have a student here at DCS who's just been diagnosed with leukemia. And um, obviously that student's studies have kind of come to a halt, especially when he's doing treatment. So you need to be really understanding and as empathetic as you can be, because our kids are going through more than we know. Um, for me, it helps being organized and I think you need to be um, technologically orientated. We haven't had buses. We didn't have buses Wednesday, Thursday this week. Today, we have a lot of students missing. I was recording some lessons this morning, sending them out to kids with the hopes that hopefully they'll catch up on the weekend. I don't know if they will, <laughs> but um, yeah, you need to be technology orientated, I, I would say as well. Okay, so um, facility. I'll show you a little bit about our school, some of the indoor, uh, indoor and outdoor spaces. So I am teaching in the village of Dinsmore. Um, this has been a really good fit for me. I was driving about 30 minutes every day from my home in Milden to Rosetown. And I've cut my commute in half coming down south to Dinsmore. So it's about 15 minutes. I, I can't believe um, how energized I feel just not having that windshield time. Uh, so this is uh, the entrance sign into Dinsmore and this is our little K to 12 school um, taken a few weeks ago after we got that big dump of snow. Here's my classroom that I'm not in right now. I'm in the counselor's office because the lady that I job share with is uh, in my classroom right now or our classroom teaching social and history. Um, yeah. So here's a picture uh, when we were celebrating or not celebrating, I guess that's the wrong word, but uh, recognizing and understanding and learning about truth and reconciliation in the fall on Orange Shirt Day. I have, there's some really talented artists here at DCS and uh, there's not a whole lot to do after school. So I wrangled these two girls in um, Savannah and Cheyenne, their names are to create a bulletin board for me. So this was in the works, the picture on the right and then the picture on the left was, the finished product um, and Savannah was actually updating my boards this morning. We've had such low students uh, that we've had kind of some, some more downtime than we're used to. Um, so probably one of the highlights of moving from Rosetown to Dinsmore is the fact that I get to be with my kids and my family a little bit more. So this is uh, my oldest son, Parker. He's in grade one. Um, we are um, here on Jersey day. And this is on the first day of school. It was just a really humbling experience, a little selfie of us. He's sitting on the iPad while I'm getting some work done. And uh, yeah, just constant, when I see him, it just constantly reminds me that I've made the right decision for us. Uh, here's another example of a student. We were doing books buying poetry and actually had a winner here that won an Indigo book card. I think it's done uh, province-wide. We had two winners in our school, actually. This was, I did, and I didn't have a picture of our winner. So this is, um, the small class sizes are just so nice to be able to go and and do so many different experiences without uh, some of the riffraff that maybe you get in a with a bigger class. Um, Dear, drop everything and read is uh, actually I think that's going what's going on right now. There's going to be a bell go that uh, indicates the end of deer. So every afternoon for the first 15, 20 minutes, we have deer and students are invested. Like I, I've never seen anything like it. And here we had uh, three students reading Caleb Dahlgren's book, Cross Roads. Uh, I sent this picture to Caleb on Instagram and he actually reached out, responded. So uh, that was kind of cool. We had some really avid readers and reading great books, like asking for books for Christmas so they can read during deer. It's very cool. Uh, and the picture down at the bottom, and you can see like the class numbers are just so, so small. I think I had a few uh, setting up a haunted house that day. It was kind of close to Halloween, but uh, they were doing a, uh, a breakout room here in phys ed. So that's my grade 11, 12 phys ed class in the bottom. Okay, uh, facilities con uh, continued. Um, 
the image on the top here is a video. Actually, they're both videos. So this one here, I'll hit play. I was on prep. Um, I don't get as many preps here as I did in Rostown in a bigger school, but this is my little guy uh, right outside my classroom window. They were building a fort. Um, so again, really humbling experience. This was on uh, this video here. They're playing chute ball. We borrowed this uh, from Rosetown. We played this last year and I kind of introduced the kids this game this year. And it was on a snow day. I only have four kids here. So it's kind of like what attendance has been like this year. And uh, okay. <laughs> they made that game up on their own. Um, one thing that I've really noticed too is because there's numbers are so small, um, they just, most of the kids just from what I've seen seem to get along and kind of make their own fun, <laughs> just pretty cool. Okay. okay. Um, so this is during psychology class. Uh, students, we got some hay clay um, from the co-op, reaching out to communities, uh, your community around you, like the support here in a small town is just extensive. And this is just one of the few examples where the co-op donated hay clay. Um, and we constructed um, some cells and we're learning about, uh, well, in Psych 30, the whole course is about womb to tomb uh, development in humans, human development. And so we were doing some cell development there. And uh, there was a school-wide Kahoot. There seems to be lots of activities in a K-12 school that I am not accustomed to. We maybe had a slight advantage being the grade 11, 12 homeroom teacher. I'm trying to think, I think it was a Christmas Kahoot that we cleaned up on. So that trophy's still sitting in my room and it gets circulated based on uh, who the champions are. Uh, this was on beach day. It was very cold that day. And uh, yeah, we came to work in the the, the, the heaters weren't working, it was, it was awful. <laughs> uh, here's Parker and uh, one of his friends uh, looking for the elf on the shelf here. Just happened to come across them, ran into them and just snapped this picture real quick. Um, another, like just the community here at, at DCS and small schools in general, I've, I've really noticed a difference. This is our, our door decorating day. So we came in like a Christmas ball and there's a picture of Mrs. Jones and myself, uh, the lady on job sharing with on this Christmas ball. So just kind of fun and uh, continually amazed um, with the traditions here at this school. And uh, every school I think has things that are awesome and different and unexpected when you start a job. And our Christmas banquet was uh, different, definitely one of those as well. And we had uh, Western Sales and GMAX, I think, sponsor that event. So it was a school-wide feast, very cool. Uh, so an extension of our facility here at the school um, is, a, is the rink. So in the fall, I had an opportunity to, uh, the lines here have been painted for three volleyball courts. They used to do um, a tournament here called Rock the Blocks. My husband brought his kids here. We were able to set up volleyball courts and run uh, because gym time um, was a little bit limited. We only have one gym, you know, in Rosetown we had two gyms, right? You could run two practices if you wanted. Um, so to get a nice time, um, after school time for practice, I was able to set up a court and you can play pickleball in there as well. Uh, the rink also has a bowling alley. So we were playing here at Jenga bowling before Christmas, the kids had a riot. And uh, this picture here uh, with the little guys. So my husband plays senior hockey here uh, in Dinsmore for the Dynamos. And uh, the community, like the school is really just a big community, a big family. And um, the town that I'm from doesn't have a school anymore. There is not really much there, even though I still call it home and Dinsmore really has become a home. And so we, we asked if our little guys could come join the senior team on the ice like the Dinsmore teams do. And right away they were, they were for it and made us feel so welcome. So this was earlier, earlier on uh, before Christmas our little Timbit team, Milden Mintos. Uh, we did a bingo bowling here. We were the champions, so our W's we won. It was my, that was another small class. I think it was a snow day too. We had a few of those uh, down at the rink. And that was uh, the grade 11, 12 class on formal day bowling before Christmas. Okay, um, I don't know if this really fits in here, but I'm gonna talk about it anyways, because uh, I've really noticed the support 
like I mentioned in the community, these are some posters that I've put up uh, both in Milden and in Dinsmore. And um, I've had a few people reach out to me. I'm looking for um, cross country skis to maybe do a little bit outdoor ed, uh, try to embrace our winter months here in the next few months. I've had a few people get in touch with me, not as many as I'd hoped. I think there's more snowmobiling here than cross country skiing, but it's worth a shot. And, and uh, people are just so willing to donate and give what they can. Um, an example of craft supply too, that's going on right now. I've had people donate some things. We're gonna be making masks uh, for our Romeo and Juliet unit in ELA 9. And I'm not used to um, being in, in so much contact with the community. Um, and it, it's just been really rewarding, really great. We've got a school newspaper called the High Flyer. And so these ads are in the High Flyer as well. So I'm, I'm guessing that those who aren't on social media or have, who haven't been down to the post office will, I'm hoping it'll gain some momentum once that issue goes out next week. Um, this is something that I'll talk about later uh, in the rewards section. Um, we were a recipient of a grant here in October um, and it was through Reebok and we were, I was able to buy some fitness equipment. This is one of the things uh, that my previous school just had an outstanding facility for students to um, work out basically. And so this is just a little clip of some of the equipment that I was able to purchase with the grant that I received. <laughs> So Kevin, I know your mic is off, but of course I had to take a video of that and just jab Mitch a little bit. <laughs> he's a, he's a guy that I used to work with. We were pretty close and um, I mean, Rosetown has all of this stuff, but it was just kind of fun to send that to him. We still keep in touch and send materials and uh, yeah, I'm just really happy I could do this for the kids. Okay. Samples of equipment I use. I didn't really know where to go with this. So I'm going to talk about some technology pieces and then I'll talk about some basic things that are maybe more expected. So some school divisions use Microsoft, some school divisions use Google. We are a Microsoft school division. So apps, um, very useful things like uh, Teams. It's like a Google Classroom equivalent. I don't use Remind 101 anymore because Teams has kind of taken the place of that. ZipGrade is um, an app that you can use. You do have to subscribe to it. Basically, it uh, marks multiple choice questions for you. So when you're marking you know, a final exam that has 100 multiple choice, it'll do it in a matter of seconds. You just need to make sure your answer key is. You need to plug in your answer key, but it's, it just saves so much time. Very cool tool. Sora, that's a reading app. I've got my bracket in there. That's for, I teach phys ed. So there's some phys ed apps in here too uh, for setting up tournament draws, et cetera. Uh, Google Drive, I've got the STF app. You can see I haven't used that. It needs to be downloaded. ProScanner is a great app. If you have an iPhone, you can use Notes as well. There's a, a scanner option on there, but I, I like this ProScanner too, and I maybe spent $4 on it, but super useful for uploading um, say short stories, things that you want to put on teams if students forget their books at home. I, I try to have all my contact, um, co sorry, all of my, um, all of my content online. So if students forget their books at home or at school, they can have access at home. Uh, what else? OneDrive, that's just where all your documents are stored. Epic and Kids A to Z is more for my son, Parker. Mm. Polar Beat is for our heart rate monitors that we use in the division. Vert is uh, just an app uh, that we use in Rosetown. I, I don't use that here because we don't have the device that measures a vertical jump. Interval Trainer is just if you're doing, um, say, uh, you want two minutes of go time for a, a circuit that you're doing and you want one minute of rest, it buzzes for those intervals. And Bowling Score, that's a new one this year because we have access to the bowling alley at the rink. Uh, it's just an easy app, free app that you can use to keep track of your bowling score. Um, something else that I use, so uh, for sure an iPad and that was bought at the school level 
and every school division will be different in terms of what is available to you. Um, but if you do have access to an iPad, I have all of my curriculums, uh, PDF versions. Of course, I don't print out curriculums anymore. I think it's just a waste of paper, a waste of space, in my opinion. And if you have them all saved on your, your iBooks feature on your iPad, then you've just kind of got them at your fingertips. I have uh, a wiki, and that's the picture, the blue there. And all the classes that I teach or have taught in the past, I have on my school website. And every time I find an article or something that I think would be useful online, I try to update this. So when I'm teaching that unit, I can go back onto my wiki and be like, oh yeah, that's what I did, or that's what I wanna do, or oh, that article, like I know um, for Health 9, when we're, we were doing our addictions unit, they just opened up some safe injection sites in Saskatoon. And I thought, oh, that would be really good to use for my health unit, you know? So you're, you know, updating your courses with things that you see in the news or things that you come across. Uh, I know we get a Friday file here in SunWest and every week there's something sent out to teachers with a list of like this week, there was uh, something about the Olympics. Not everything pertains to you. That's what pertained to me this week. And so I save that website in, uh, I don't know if I've done that yet actually, but I'll save that to my phys ed, um, to my phys ed class page so I can go back and find it. Other things that are handy, again, nothing's, none of this is necessary. You need to find what works for you, but um, a desk mount camera. Um, we don't have laptops here for teachers at DCS. So that might be something that's useful, but if you've got a, a tripod and an iPad, you can do most of what you wanna do with that. For sure, computer. At home, I have a Bluetooth printer. I think Bluetooth is one word, sorry, there's a typo there. And um, I've been doing a lot of printing from my phone. It's, it's just been really easy and kind of effective. So that's something that I've really enjoyed. Uh, I just went in and bought some bulletin board supplies and some supplies for making masks. So that might be something else. Um, I, I don't know if that classifies as equipment, but, um, and something that I use in the gym quite often is an Apple Music subscription. And uh, there can be some pretty explicit lyrics in Apple Music. So there's also a feature in there that you can um, turn all the explicit um, music off, which is nice. It filters it for you. So some re rewards of this occupation, for sure, student success, student happiness. For me personally, it's been very rewarding being more involved with my kids, getting to drive my son who's not in school to daycare, being able to pick him up. Even that, you know, 15 minutes that we're in the car, 30 minutes, two ways, it's just nice to be able to touch base with them and almost decompress together before we get home and unpack bags and get supper ready, et cetera. And of course, seeing my son at assembly, seeing my son waiting in line for the bathroom, seeing my son, hearing my son getting in trouble while he's at the library, <laughs> you know? Uh, it's just been so, so cool. And for sure, probably one of the biggest rewards so far for me, next up to my kids, I would say, is being a recipient of that Reebok grant and uh, getting to buy some equipment for the kids. And I've got uh, students who are coming in before school and have plans to uh, work on their fitness outside of school time, which is very cool. Challenges of the occupation. <clears throat> so just like any career, there's gonna be things that are negative and teaching, teaching is no different. And you feel like your job is never complete. There is always a to-do to list, more that you could be doing, more that you should be doing that you feel is nagging you. Um, sometimes you can get negative feedback from the community that maybe you hear at a hockey game or um, you know, at the grocery store. I haven't seen a lot of, a lot of that, but it, it certainly is a challenge for sure. Uh, negative feedback from, from parents, uh, difficult students, uh, multi-grade classes are certainly a challenge, has been a challenge for me. I grew up in a multi-grade classroom where I went to school in Milden, but up to this point had only taught in single grade classes. And so that has been a challenge. And I know as we're approaching final exam time, we're certainly behind in that ELA 910 class, but uh, we're trying to, we're trying to push through, but it has been a challenge for sure. But they're used to it. They're used to the multi-grade stuff. It's me who's not used to it. Six students, that has been a huge challenge since this pandemic started. Like I had one kid out of six in grade nine today and we continued on. Like, I mean, we've had, this is our third day back. And so that's where I went in and 
Uh, thank you to technology, did some recordings with the hopes that students will be watching that Friday and Saturday night. Yeah, right, we'll see. And weather certainly has been a challenge too with uh, buses being canceled. Um, the pandemic in itself has been a challenge for sure, but we're getting through it. Okay, salary. So I had to do a bit of investigating for this, uh, for this topic, for sure. I've got a few different things here and you're going to have to look at the years. So up until this point, I have been on a, what's called a 1.0 FTE. It's basically you're working full time. And I am a class five teacher. So I have a I have a kinesiology degree, combined kinesiology degree and education degree. So because I have two degrees, I'm, I'm considered a class five and, and the more education you have, the more that you're going to get paid essentially. Um, so that's, that's one way to earn more money. The other way is in your, your steps. So right here, I've got, uh, in September of 2011, I was a five dash one which means that I was a class five, which doesn't change unless you increase your education year one or step one, okay? Um, so my gross was, um, that's not take home pay, the net is the take home pay. So yeah, you can just kind of look at those numbers. So then in, that was 2011, that was my first year of teaching. In 2020, that was my eighth year of teaching. So you can see that things do go up exponentially. Um, and then I just wanted to show you the difference uh, from a 100% contract to an 80% contract, uh, definitely, definitely goes down, you know, three, $400 for me. And that's something that I investigated kind of to try to determine if I could afford it and if we could make it work. Um, so yeah, there certainly is a difference, but that's something you need to evaluate too. Okay, benefits. And I'm looking forward to seeing and hearing what other teachers have to say about benefits because I am not an expert. I feel like I need maybe to be educated on this section, but I'm going to tell you what I know and I'll show you a little screen share here of, of what us teachers do to submit insurance claims, etc. So we're with uh, Canada Life, um, which has a group net app and I'll show you a video here. Um, <clears throat> so basically, I know some people still mail in their claims. I do everything, try to do everything electronically, but this app will just show you kind of what is available to you. And I tend to use the same thing like massage therapy over and over, but there's lots available to us that I really don't utilize. So I've got uh, my spouse, I've got my dependents there, my kids. You can go on and there's different categories, drugs, health, and it's got all of those options there, most of which I have, and have not taken advantage of. Speech therapy was great for my youngest son, medical equipment and supplies. Um, I know I have a colleague whose wife is diabetic and they're able to submit uh, through this and then your medical services that you may need in addition to vision. Uh, dentist, uh, dentistry is not on there because I think it submits um, or it deducts automatically while you're at the dentist office. So that's super nice when you have those um, directly done. But everything else that you want to be reimbursed for that we just saw on that little screen share, you do need to submit yourself. You won't get reimbursed unless you do that. So it's wise to either submit right after, say you've had a massage or used, you know, gotten a prescription that wasn't fully covered or do it monthly like be organized about it have a folder um, even if you don't get to it right away and then write on there if it has been submitted or not so you're not second guessing if if you've submitted that claim or not so for pension again this is this is something else I'm not an expert on even though I'm in year 10 I should be you know maybe learning more about this but each month I have uh, $704 deducted off my check each month that goes towards pension. I just got a letter from SDF right now saying that if I retire in, I don't know, even remember <laughs> what the year was, but I would be eligible to receive $769 per month. Um, and that is from our SDF pension. When you turn 65, you're el also eligible to get your, your Canadian pension plan. But my mom was just telling me, and again, Kevin, you might be able to, to attest to this more than I, but 
Um, she was saying that the amount is still the same. It's just coming from different places, like half of it coming from CPP, half of it coming from your STF. That's, um, that's, at age 65, it bridges across. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Uh, holidays, yeah, not complaining about holidays. That's for sure. One of the perks, but uh, even though we have downtime and holidays, like for me, my husband is not a teacher. I'm at home with my kids. It was a lot more relaxing. My, my summer holidays, especially maybe a little bit more boring, but a lot more relaxing before I had kids because um, they're with me in the summer. So we certainly try to keep busy, but there's always things you want to get done in the summer. Whether you've got like last year, I was moving classrooms. I was getting ready for new classes that I'm teaching. And, and I think you want to try to stay in order for me to enjoy my job. You want to try to stay fresh and update and, and uh, make your classes interesting. So your downtime is when you're doing that. It's not a lot of time during the teaching year when you're, when you're doing that, right? Sometimes you get, you get so you're in survival mode during the school year. Typical work hours. Well, here at Dinsmore, the school day goes from um, 8.45 to 3.10. So we have an early dismissal here. We have uh, no breaks really during the day. And, um, but I mean, am I here longer than that? Yeah, you betcha. I'm, you know, usually up by 6, 6.30 out the door by, you know, 7.30, 7.45. And I'm here usually till 4.30. And after I get my kids to bed, I try to put in an hour to two hours a night. Usually I try to kind of shut down shop at nine o'clock and from nine to 10, um, watch a show or, or just kind of decompress, go for a walk, whatever. So yep, the days, the days can be long. And I mean, it, it varies from year to year. Like as we ramp up for final exams here, I'll be working a little bit more for sure. Okay, educational requirements. Um, so I got accepted into the College of Kinesiology after I graduated grade 12. Um, so I did a few years in kinesiology and then I decided I wanted to do the kinesiology combined program, which um, um, means that you'll have an education degree in addition to a kinesiology degree resulting in a class five when you're done. And uh, they still have that King combined degree at, uh, I went to the U of S at the U of S and um, yeah, uh, uh, I don't know if there's anything else I need to touch on on that, but uh, uh, some optional courses that I am qualified for that, that uh, um, other people may want to be qualified in as well. Respect in sport, uh, concussion in sport. Those are both two things if you're wanting to coach. Um, there's a hockey one too. I'm trying to think you have to do respect in sport. There's another hockey one that you have to do for um, Saskatchewan hockey as well. Um, but if you're coaching at the SHSA level, you need to have those two. Um, I do have my, my first aid, which includes the CPR and AED. Um, our staff has done the four seasons of truth and reconciliation, which was offered through um, our distance learning center in Caniston in Sunwest School Division, which was very informative, talks about, you know, Canadian history and, and the truth and um, um, misfortunes that happened during the residential school era and the result of that and the, and the ripple that it has come to be, you know, recently that we're all that's in the spotlight in the news now and our road to, to recovery and reconciliation. I've also taken my safe food handling. I I'm now the foods 30 teacher here, which terrifies me, um, but I need to get my food, safe food handling um, in order to teach that course. So my journey. So I think every career has an evolution. And for me, uh, I, th this job, when I switched this job, when I switched over to this job, I applied for this job. I didn't know if I was ready. I didn't know if I was qualified enough. I didn't know if I wanted it. And I am so glad that I took the chance. It has been such a positive change for me to do what's right for my family. And so don't be afraid about new courses or new staff or just new period. Don't be afraid of, of doing something different and going against the grain. Uh, get involved, get involved with the community, get involved uh, in your school as much as you can. I mean, I think you still need to set uh, boundaries and parameters for what's realistic for you, especially in your first few years 
of teaching. You want to avoid the burnout epidemic for sure, but do get involved as well. You need, to, you need to start somewhere. And with time, I think you can mold, you can shape, you can adjust and do what feels right. Opportunities. So job market, I've put Michelle Leith's name in brackets here. She is our human resources person at Sunwest School Division. And um, there are postings, um, I'm assuming for every school division, uh, Sunwest certainly has postings that will become available um, for people as jobs are released, certainly uh, March, April, May, even into June are kind of hot months for when lots of change is happening. Um, so just look at the school division's website if you're looking for any kind of job opportunities. Um, I have a friend, former student that, um, that I actually coached with this year and she's in education. And she's been EAing in Sunwest School Division. I thought just what a great way to get your, your name in the division, to get some experience, get to know the kids, the teachers, and for them to get to know you. So if you're, you know, once you have your education degree, um, you've kind of got a, a heads up. So that was something else for opportunity that I, I just wanted to add in there. For me, I don't know where I want to go next. Like I'm really content where I am right right here. I've often thought about if something um, consulting wise came up, I would be interested in that. Right now, I have no interest getting my master's, but you certainly could continue to um, get educated. You could go into administration. I know my principal is getting her PhD right now. But in my opinion, there's room for advancement without completing courses. I think that for me, my job is rewarding by doing different things, by staying fresh, um, by making sure that the kids are enjoying their learning journey. So that's where I'm at right now. Life work balance, million dollar question. My husband, uh, Russ Billet, he's very good at maintaining life work balance. He's also very laid back, which I am not. Um, and I'm gonna talk about the medicine wheel approach, kind of my approach to maintaining that work-life balance. Kevin, I put your name in there because uh, you were a master, in my opinion, at uh, maintaining life work. And I just thought you did it so effortlessly in person. I know there's probably a lot behind the scenes. Um, I had a, a conversation with my, that was one of the questions that I asked. We had an opportunity to pose questions to our director. Randy Emerson is our wonderful director in the division here. And I asked him that. And he said, you know, just taking time out of my day to, for me, speak to my wife, going for a walk. And I don't know what the answer is. You need to find what works for you. And, and for me, um, I've kind of used this medicine wheel approach and kind of tailored it to fit me. And family, my work, my career, my hobbies, and my work at home, all of those things, I need to be tackling all of those things in some way. And there's, it's multifaceted and you need to be doing what keeps you happy. And sometimes you're gonna be off tilt and that's just the way it is. So again, I'm looking forward to hear what other teachers have to say about that because I am I'm not a master in that area as well. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for listening to me. It's awesome, Chelsea. Um... I'm not sure I'm a master at life work balance. I, I, I agree with what you're saying though. I think it's, you just have to go with what, uh, what works for you and, and, and it, it probably changes over time and it changes within a year even. You yeah. probably, I know teaching's got cycles to it and uh, there's probably times at like end of a semester, it gets busy and uh, but you'll find time for the family and the hobbies somewhere in there and, uh, and you make it work. So that's good. Mm -hmm. Uh, just a, a couple comments or questions. It, it sounds like you talked a lot about community. Uh, like you, you're being in a larger school at Rosetown for nine years. Is there like, and not to, not to knock being in Rosetown. I mean, we ta I taught there with you for a number of years and it's a good place to teach, but is there a much more, uh, a greater sense of community in the small K to 12 school than in the large school or? Absolutely. There is. And I'm continually amazed um by the involvement like uh i don't know i don't know what it is there's just so much tradition rooted in the school and and parents there's there's not someone else to do the job like we are all we have we can't really you know look around and figure out 
you know, well, who's going to do that? Like we need to do it. Right. Because there's, uh, we're all we have. And, um, because we had such a wide variety of, of, uh, talents in Rosetown, it seemed like people were, were very specialized, which was so cool to work with people who were so specialized in industrial arts and home ec and phys ed, et cetera. Um, but we really need to rely on other people to have um, some of the things that bigger centers do. So um, people are just willing to help out and lend a hand and it's just yeah. blown me away. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, and I know, and it's been a long time, but I know my experience when I taught at Milton, your old school, and I, I had that, I had a similar experience when I taught in a small K to 12 school. It was, it was very community oriented and family oriented. It seemed like, yeah. And so I did, I'm glad to see that you're, you're getting that from that, from this experience, because it, because it is pretty neat. Like when you see, uh, sorry to interrupt you, when you see, um, like I'll bring my oldest son, not so much my younger one because he's too wild but my oldest son to hockey games and uh you see other kids older kids giving him high fives when he comes trotting down to my classroom after school and they're they're teasing him and hey parker how are you doing today like it's it's just so so heartwarming seeing this. kind of a thorough yeah. thorough family connection there yeah that's awesome sure. Yeah, for sure. um i think you've answered that you, you're really thorough you think you answered a lot of the questions uh can you maybe maybe emphasize like you've got some new preps this year so what what happens as a teacher when you know even you know you've, you're in your 10th year teaching so when you get a new class what does that change in your work workload just to let people know that yeah it's um people have different approaches to how they plan courses and uh, a lot of my summer was dedicated to that i'm not gonna lie uh, especially to my english class uh, my english nine class i taught english 10 before and I'm really relying on my old content for English 10 because the content in ELA 9, like I'm starting Romeo and Juliet, I've never taught that play before. It's Shakespeare. It's, you know, for me, takes a little bit of work behind the scenes. And it's, it can be all encompassing. It can be all consuming. You need to find resources out there that will work for you. Not everything needs to be perfect. But for me, I start with a curriculum. Um, I find, you know, stories. I find resources. I talk to other people teachers like there is no shame in reaching out to other people like I am willing to share whatever I have and and um, people have been willing to share with me and just kind of creating um, that kind of mutual understanding that that sharing is what we need to do to be able to thrive to succeed to keep our head above water some days um, just try to utilize the people, the resources that you have, but it, it, it can be all encompassing. It can take up a, a lot of time. And I'm not going to lie, like all this week, this is my first week back after Christmas. Every night I've been doing something for ELA nine in preparation for starting that unit. Yeah. And I, I'm starting to get a lot of angst about teaching foods 30 next semester. Like that is something totally new for me. I absolutely completely um, burned a bag of rice before Christmas. And uh, smoke alarms weren't going off, which was kind of alarming in itself, but it, there was a haze in the school and I'm getting comments, oh, the new foods teacher just burned this, you know, this rice, et cetera. And um, uh, yeah, just kind of a funny story, but I am starting, I am starting to get a lot of angst about that class because I did not put in the prep that I, I should have during Christmas break. Um, I did take some downtime. There were some other things that I was doing, but uh, the life work balance. Not, not doing that planning from from nine to three. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so when you first teach, like uh, teach a subject, uh, let's say that ELA nine, like how many times through it do you think you'd be before you kind of go, okay, not that it's ever set in stone. You're always trying to tweak things here and there before you're kind of going, okay, I, I'm I'm happy with where it's at at least. Yeah, that's a good question. Like if I'm teaching it every year. Like psychology, for example, here is every second year. So I'm trying to think, I would have to teach probably something like four or five times to really have, and that's maybe is excessive. I don't know, but uh, yeah, that would be my number, Kevin. Mm -hmm. no, I, I would have said five myself. So I was just wondering, I was wondering what you, you know, I, and I just thought, I think sometimes with, with young teachers that are watching this or potential teachers to realize that you don't, you don't have to have all that, you know, like you're going to get through some things, you know, in your first couple of years, 
you know, you're going to kind of hang on and then it's going to get better, <laughs> especially if you teach the same subject. It, it, mm -hmm. it's a little easier because you, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every year kind of thing. Yeah, you need to start somewhere. And and we all have things that are kind of cringe worthy at the beginning of our careers. And I'm sure I'll look back in, uh, you know, five or six years when I'm still teaching ELA 9 probably and be like, ooh, you know, that could have been a lot better. But it's, yeah. it evolves. Yeah. Everything evolves. And you need That's to great. be patient with yourself. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Gord, do you have any questions? When, you, uh, when you're teaching multi-grades, uh, folks need to understand, and I think your administration does it, you probably have three exams then when you do, when it comes exam time, uh, or you would have one exam with one class, you've got three exams to prepare, correct? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, when you're teaching those multi-grade classes, it's definitely double, double the amount of prep, double the amount of work in one time. Phys Ed is a little bit different. Like, yeah, there's, there is two curriculums, but I mean, I can, um, I don't want to say get away with more, but there's just so much more overlap in a phys ed class versus an English class. But uh, yeah, it's definitely a lot more work. The nice thing here at Dinsmore Composite is uh, they do final interviews for ELA classes. So I'm still going to be creating two different interviews and technically grade nine, they could have a midterm, but their course goes all year. So they don't have a final exam, but they will at the end of the year. So absolutely, you're, you're working with two different curriculums at the same time. And uh, it's it's just a balancing, it's absolutely a balancing act. The, the saving grace in all of it, I think, is that the kids are used to it. Like it's me who's who needs to adapt. <laughs> but uh, it's also been very cool watching Karen run her multi-grade class with social and history. I've picked up on a lot of tips and tricks because she's been teaching multi-grade classes for years, so. <laughs> That, that probably is a neat opportunity. I never thought of that, but it would be mm -hmm. to, to watch when somebody's been doing it for a while. Yeah. For sure. Well, I've got no other questions, Gord, anymore. No, I'm I'm good. Thanks. Okay. And we'll, we'll pause that then and stop it. Sure.